start webinar. There you go. That should do it. Yeah, some, some guys logging in now. Yeah, it's always encouraging when you know the link actually works, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Made that mistake before. Oh, yeah. And then you've, you've turned your emails off so they're not pinging through. And then you you quickly check your emails and notice you've got several emails saying, I can't get logged in. Right. Good morning to those who have joined. We're probably going to give people a couple of minutes and then get started. So Andy, I was wondering, even though we're being recorded, when does Scotland have a lot of turf now? Is that what's happening with all the rain? What are they doing for facility? Um, yeah, so most academy games are now played um, on artificial surfaces, 3G surfaces. Um, predominantly, professional football is played on grass. However, there are still probably 10, 11, 12, first teams to, who now have um, artificial surfaces at their stadiums now as well. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a hot debate in Scottish football, whether you should be allowed to play professional football on a synthetic pitch. Hmm. Hopefully we don't have to, to cross that bridge tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so far, none of, none, of the, none of the pro teams play on turf then, none? Tall grass. Yeah. Must yeah. Have incredible. Yeah. No. So you no. Know, we do have. We do have a few. There are a few. Um. But as I said, they're they're, they're highly criticised for for having uh, stadiums that play in turf. Maybe we'll wait till 11.03. Does it sound all right with you? Yeah, not a problem. I think we have. The numbers are starting to, to creep up slowly as they, as they usually do. I think we're at 14 now. Seems like a, a, a friendly group anyway. We've already had yeah. Gavin and, and Harris saying hello. So that's always a good start. It's a friendly audience. Well, Andy, if it's all right with you, we may start. Is that all right? Of course, not a problem. Okay. So good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Fullerton. I am the coordinator of club services for NorCal Premier, and we are hosting this webinar. This webinar is a response to surveys that our club leaders uh, filled out last fall requesting uh, topics for NorCal to present of uh, value to clubs for club development. And one of the top two topics was promoting character development and life lessons through our sport experience. And so we are very um, fortunate to have Andy Goldie with us. Andy is from Scotland. Uh, what part of Scotland, Andy? Could you share that? Yeah, we, we're uh, northeast, you, you'll say, northeast of Scotland. And he, Andy's the director of Dundee United Football Club. Uh, Andy has his UEFA A, his UEFA Elite Youth License, the Scottish FA Advanced Children's License, and he's also the youngest academy director currently in Scotland. Uh, he's experienced with UEFA uh, and Scot Scottish international teams, uh, and he's done um, some other webinars and presentations on this topic um, with for MLS teams, for example. He's 
He's done presentations for the San Jose Earthquakes, for the Vancouver Whitecaps, and for Cincinnati. And so uh, thank you, Andy, for joining us. And I, if it's okay with you, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rick. And, and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for joining me this evening, or in your case, uh, th this morning. Um, as, as Rick um, mentioned there, tonight I'm hoping to share um, some of the, the initiatives and ideas that we run at Dundee United Football Club. Um, and around this topic of developing the person. We think uh, soccer and football back in the UK um, is highly criticised for bringing young people into their academy programme and when their surplus to requirements are deemed not good enough to make the professional grade, um, they are um, quoted as being thrown on the scrap heap. So we make a conscious effort to, to make the academy journey more about developing the person rather than just uh, limiting ourselves to one objective, which is to become a professional footballer or to not become a professional footballer. If we limit ourselves to one objective, ultimately we are going to have more failures than successes. So it's important that we give all our young people within the academy, whether they're successful or not successful, the best experience possible. So tonight, hopefully, we can share some ideas. What I will say is we don't do everything perfect. We, we still go through a trial and error process. We do get things wrong as well, uh, but we do believe um, we're industry leading with how we are developing our young people within the academy as well. So Rick, Rick gave um, a, a lovely um, summary of, of my career so far. Um, just to give, so you guys know who, who is speaking to you tonight. I've now been uh, coaching now for 15, 16 years, having graduated from university uh, where I studied the sciences um, that now underpin my own coaching methodology and the coaching methodology at Dundee United. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with a number of uh, clubs within Scotland, um, Hamilton, Dundee United, Glasgow Rangers, uh, for a short period of time. Also the Scottish FA, uh, UEFA, Middlesbrough Football Club, um, as well as, as doing um, various other uh, roles within football to, one, to develop myself um, and to give myself a, a better all-round holistic experience within football. Uh, I became the youngest uh, elite performance coach with the Scottish FA back in 2012, um, where I had the, the privilege of working with some real top talent um, throughout Scotland, um, most notably Billy Gilmore, who is also now at Chelsea and a Scotland international player, um, but several other players that are that are younger. Stuart McKinstry at Leeds United um, is another one who, who is continuing to progress, but there's over 60 professional contracts were gained through the programmes that, that I coached within there uh, over my seven years. Uh, I was then appointed academy director uh, at Dundee United Football Club in 2019, uh, as Rick said, and I, I hope nobody judged, thinking Andy can't be that young, uh, given how much I've aged since 2019 in this job. Um, but yeah, I was I'm currently the youngest academy director in Scotland, which I'm really proud of, um, given how hard I had to work as a volunteer and as a young coach um, without any soccer um, playing experience. I had to work extremely hard to, to earn those opportunities. And that's continued in my current role. Uh, I've now been promoted to the executive team within the club, which now leads me into uh, having an influence on club-wide decisions and the long-term strategy of the, the overall club, uh, and not just the academy, which is uh, another exciting um, bit of progress within my career, but also great for my own development as well, as I look to progress my own career um, long-term as well. And then recently, uh, the Scottish FA have just appointed me um, as part of the Club Academy Scotland Working Group, which is you guys' equivalent of the MLS Next programme, um, as we look to, to develop a nationwide strategy for developing young players now as well. So as you can see, gradually I've moved off the pitch, um, which in Scotland I, I'm not overly concerned about because the weather isn't particularly great here uh, and I'm more based uh, indoors now in meetings and the office um, where my job is more about strategy and processes um, and the long-term vision of the club rather than uh, the day-to-day -day coaching and development of the players. 
So Andy, tonight I'm going to, sorry. sorry. Can I just make a quick comment? I should have said this. If oh, anyone has questions as Andy's presenting, please, I'll be monitoring the Q&A. So go ahead and type those in. Okay, Hello. thanks, Rick. Uh, so tonight, uh, we're solely focused on, on what we do at Dundee United Football Club. Uh, I'll give you an overview of our vision, uh, our mission statement, because that will that will set the scene for our culture, uh, which is a big part of, of tonight's workshop. Our way, which is our coaching methodology, but we'll focus particularly on how we uh, develop the, the young person. And then give you an insight into the success that we've had so far um, in this three year cycle. So to start with, just to paint a picture, we, we are a very ambitious club. Um, we have a, a, a renowned and rich history of developing young footballers for the, the very top end of the game. Uh, we currently have two academy graduates uh, playing their trade in the MLS, Johnny Russell at Sporting Kansas and Ryan Gold at Vancouver Whitecaps, both who had tremendous seasons last year in the MLS. Um, but we also have a number of uh, Scotland international youth players, players that play in the English Premier League. Uh, and I've had a history of that throughout the years. And in the 80s, uh, we actually won the league and beat Barcelona uh, with a full team of academy graduates. So that is that is inspirational for us. And that is what we use uh, to inspire the future. And we want to now create players and develop players who can go and deliver success back to Dundee United, but can also enhance their own career by playing at the highest level uh, in European and international, uh, international football. But the last seven or eight words there um, in the vision statement is what we are all about. It has to be in an environment that will also grow, aid their growth as individuals. And that will be the main discussion for tonight. Our mission statement, is to provide our young people with the support, education, and experiences that lay the foundations for their future success in life, whilst creating memories that last a lifetime. We know, as I said right at the very start, we know that not every young person within our academy programme will have a career or make a living from professional football. So it's so important to us that we have to create memories that will last longer than any career in the game because that's the one thing we can guarantee that they take away with them, regardless of their future success within soccer. It's so important for us that our young people are looked after, they're supported, they're provided with unbelievable experiences that makes them fall in love with the game, not just now, but prolongs that over a period of time as well. And these skills and experiences should be able to transfer across to, to different parts of their life, regardless of their success in football as well. So how do we go about that? So the culture is unbelievably important here at Dundee United. We view this as the most important part of our programme. Without this culture, where everybody feels they belong and connected to it, we can't achieve any success. So it's vitally important for us that, that we live and breathe our four principles every day, every night, even at the weekend when the kids are not with us, it's important that they buy into to these four principles. The first one is the most important one, and it's accountability. We sell this to our young players and young people by telling them we can give them all the experiences, all the support, the best coaching methodology, the best training sessions, the best game experiences. We can give them as much as we possibly can, but it will not mean anything for their future success unless they take responsibility themselves. Now, again, this is the first transferable skill that we teach our young players, regardless if they're going to be a, a young footballer or they're going to have a career elsewhere in a different business. It's so important that the kids are taught how to take accountability and how to develop that within them. And I'll go into more detail about these and how we deliver them on a daily basis. Ambition, we, we are brave, very brave. In our, our vision, we are very brave in our playing style. We are very brave in how we develop young players. Um, and you'll see that that will come out more and more throughout the presentation tonight. But we want our young people to be ambitious. We inherited a culture when, I don't know if, if, if anyone is aware of this, 
but Dundee United rivals Dundee FC are in the same street. Their stadiums are in the exact same street and they are 300 yards apart. The mentality what we inherited and the culture we inherited was as long as we are better than our rivals, then we'll be, we'll be fine. That's okay. That is an ambition. If we are limiting ourselves to be the best in the street, we're never going to be one of the best in Europe. So it's important that we promote ambition. Achievement. If we're going to promote ambition, then we need to celebrate the successes, whether it's a small success, a short-term success, or a slight bit of progress, or it's the ultimate success where they achieve something long-term. For example, earning a, a professional contract, making their professional debut, being recognised as an international footballer, having success in whatever career path they choose in the future is the ultimate achievement. But we must celebrate each milestone along the way. And the final one is all together. We are very much about developing the individual person, but we need, we need everyone to be able to do that. So as you all know, soccer is very much a team sport. Although not every single individual within the team will become a professional footballer, they all need one another to, to give themselves the best experience, the best challenge, and the best opportunity for them to go and progress and enjoy their experience. So how do we develop them? Firstly, in accountability. So we involve our players in everything that we do. We, we are branded our academy, and it's our academy because it belongs to the players, it belongs to the parents, it belongs to all our stakeholders. We very much involve all our stakeholders with the full programme. Now, we don't take every single bit of feedback and action it, but we make sure that all our stakeholders are able to provide us um, with feedback, with insight, and with their, their opinion on how we can progress um, as an academy. To do that, we we very much encourage our young players to monitor their own performance. So after every game, all of our young players um, use Huddle, where they clip their own game, they report back on their own game and feedback on their own game in relation to their individual development plan. Interpreting performance is between the coach and the young person. That is so important because if, if the young player is continuously monitoring their performance and believes that they're performing well every single week when we don't believe they're, they're progressing or they're, they're making sufficient progress, then there's an issue there. So it's so important that we help and develop our young people to be able to interpret their performance, to take accountability and be really honest with themselves um, for their further development as well. And then the most important part, there is no point in doing the self-analysis, monitoring your performance, interpret, uh, interpreting the, the performance uh, alongside the coach if you're not going to do anything about it. We don't want a piece of paper or a player report or a few clips that aren't action. So the most important part is initiating action. We must do something about it. There is no point in collecting data or all this information if the young person, along with the support of the, the, the coaching staff and the, the development staff, if they don't action it, they must put something into action. In terms of ambition, ambition is made up of desire, motivation, determination, innovation, and creativity. Without any of those five things, we, we don't believe our young players can be ambitious. We want to push boundaries, we want to try things new. As I said right at the start, we, we do make mistakes. We don't get everything right. But if we make mistakes within our comfort zone, we'll never, ever, ever progress. So it's important that we're continuously pushing the boundaries of what we can achieve, what our young people can achieve. And we can only do this by promoting these five different things. So the desire of a young person wanting to become the very best the motivation for them to turn up every single day, to put the extra practice in when nobody's looking, to make sure their schoolwork is being complete at the same time as trying to develop as a young footballer. The determination to be the very best. It doesn't matter if they're knocked down, doesn't matter how many times they fail. It's important that we put the support round about them and encourage them to continue to go to break down that barrier. 
and the innovation and the creativity is to think differently. There is no point, and I think there's a quote around, I think it was possibly Einstein, is the definition of madness, is to continue to do the same thing over and over again. That's, we're not going to go anywhere. The way the game and the sport of soccer is evolving with Pep Guardiola and Jesse Marsh and Jurgen Klopp, these guys are real innovators in football. We are not developing young people for the game now. We are developing them for the future game. So it's so important for us that we innovate and we look to create the future player. The future player can't be seen right now. Nobody knows what that looks like. So it's so important for us that we allow and promote our young players to be the best version of themselves. Now, we don't want to bring a, a, a player who's um, predominantly a passer of the football and make him a dribbler. We just make him the best passer. We, we work on his vision, we work on his awareness, and we try and make him the best there. If we've got a dribbler who loves to try skills and tricks and try and beat players 1v1, we make him even better at that. We don't ask him to pass the ball. We just make him a better dribbler. And because these players are in control of what the future game looks like, and it's them, they have to be ambitious enough, and we need to promote that ambition that they can change the game, in particular in Scotland. In achievement, the first and the most important part of any culture, of any environment, regardless of your age, is enjoyment. If the young people in your programme do not enjoy coming to training sessions, coming to practice, coming to games, love the sport, you will not get anything from them. You'll get nothing from them at all. It's so important. And if you take one thing away this morning, as, as a coach, the most important thing for you is to create a connection with your young players. And you can only create a connection if you show them how much you care. And you show them how much you care by making sure that every training session, they leave with the same excitement that they came in, with a big smile on their face, looking forward to the next training session. They should never want to leave the pitch. They should always want more. We always celebrate progress, and that progress could be achieving a short-term goal. It could be improving a certain part of their game. It could be that their attendance is getting better. It could be something within their education program. And I'll speak a wee bit more about that, but we must recognise that. One of the things that we say is when the team scores a goal, every player must celebrate with the player because everybody has played a part. But on the same token, referring to accountability again, when we concede a goal, we all must take accountability for that as well. So we'll, we'll look at that. And it's important that we all recognise when, when achievement happens regardless if it's the smallest achievement or the biggest achievement. And we also must recognise the role that everyone has played in that. As I mentioned, all together is a big feature for us in our culture. And it's important that we recognise the smallest of impact um, that, that our staff, our players, our parents, our stakeholders can make in celebrating the longer term achievements as well. And the final one is all together. We firmly believe that these two things, well-being and performance, can no longer be separated. They must be together. You cannot have one without the other anymore. There is more and more research um, around well-being and performance working together. Um, and we fully believe, as I mentioned earlier on, that a happy child will be a child who is performing well as well. And that's not just in soccer, it's also in education. It's also in their, their life outside uh, soccer as well. To create that, it must be an inclusive culture. I've mentioned already that we promote the sharing of feedback, the sharing of ideas. Um, we allow our parents, our stakeholders, our players to feedback information into us. We involve them in the process. We listen to their voice um, and we really, really make sure that this feels like a home and it feels like an extended family to them. Somewhere they feel safe, somewhere they can make mistakes, somewhere they can voice their opinion, and most importantly, somewhere they feel they belong. It feels bigger than just football itself. And that's when you get the connection that I spoke about earlier. It's so important young people have that connection. We, we can't look through adult eyes 
at these young people. These young people look at the world completely different to what we looked at it. It's so important that these we try and look through the the look at the world through their eyes, not ours, because they are in charge of our future, as I've said earlier on. So how does that look? Sorry, don't, I can just stop there, Rick, if you want any questions so far, just on those those four main principles. Uh, no, there's not not questions yet. So you could go on. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So our way. Our way is split into five different sections. Performance, ultimately, we are still a football club. We are still trying to develop international uh, footballers, so performance must play a part in it. Uh, support, in terms of how we, we put the support and the ecosystem around the player and the young person. The identity of the football club, but also, and more importantly, the identity of the young person. The, the education and the wider piece to make sure that our young, uh, our young people are, are, have an alternative career. Uh, and they're also developing their brains because their brain is ultimately the, the best muscle they can use within their body to become a professional footballer and the experience they get. And that's the experience of a training session. It's the experience of them turning up to a match. It's the experience of getting their training kit. The whole experience is so important. So just go into each one um, with a bit more detail. So how do we then, what does this look like for us uh, on a daily basis? So in terms of performance, each and every player within our academy programme has an individual development plan, which is uniquely tailored towards who they are. Not who they're not, but who they are. As I mentioned earlier on, as an example, if we have a player who is a dribbler, our, the individual development plan for that young player will be to make him a better dribbler. It won't be to change him and turn him into a, a tough tackler or another profile of player. It will be to create super strengths in that young player instead of working on the same things that they can't do. What I found in Scotland over the last 15, 16 years is that we focus so much on what young players can't do that we, we never improve what they can already do. Top players in the world, apart from the obvious two of Messi and Ronaldo when, when they were at their prime, the very best players in the world, if you watch them, more often than not, they are only world-class at three or four different things. If we had them in Scotland for the last 15 years, they would be average at those three or four things, but they would be average at quite a lot of things because we work on weaknesses too much. We have to work in their strengths and make them super strengths. We have a mental performance programme, which is tailored uh, and it's age and stage specific as well. Our mental performance coaches work hand in hand with our coaching staff, our technical staff, to make sure the culture is evolving, it's adhered to, it's living and breathing. It's not just something that's on a bit of paper. They'd also do some one-to-one, -one, um, almost, what would, what would be the word, a referral. So if we feel that there's a boy who is short in confidence or as requires maybe some coping skills or some mental strategies, there'll be some one-to-one -one work there, but they also work with the group collectively. And recently, our mental performance coaches and some of our staff delivered some culture workshops with our young players where they created what they called the non-negotiables of how they're going to live and breathe our culture, not just in practice, not just in games, but also back home when they're not with the rest of their teammates, how, what, how are they going to live our culture? And each age group have created their own non-negotiables, a set of rules that they're going to follow They've created a, a contract for each age group and they've all signed it to say they're signing up uh, to our culture in each of the age groups, which is absolutely fantastic. Self-analysis I spoke about earlier on. We, when I first came into post um, three years ago, we were given, 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 given constantly. They were getting great performance analysis and they were getting great mental performance programs and we were constantly receiving what we found is the, the accountability was the, the, the key connection that was lacking. So it's so important that we trust our young players to take care of this themselves. 
So we teach them how to self-analyse each other and themselves as well. We're also in the process of developing a mentorship programme where senior academy players or academy graduates are assigned to younger academy players coming through to share their experiences, to pass on their advice, and to just be a sounding wall. If any young players would like to talk, then our 11-year-old player could go and speak to our 18, 19, 20-year-old player. If we're very lucky, we'll be able to get Ryan Gold and Johnny Russells and John Sutters and players that have been so successful in the past coming through our academy, we'll, we'll involve them as part of our mentorship programme as well. And then the final one is our master classes. Over the last 18 months, uh, 12 to 18 months, we have had all of our academy graduates who have achieved remarkable success, plus some top players such as Billy Gilmore in the Premier League, come and present and do Q&A sessions with our young players as well. Not only is this to, to inspire them to see what can be achieved, but it's also, also to give them an insight into how a young a professional footballer lives, but also how difficult the journey is as well, because it isn't a, a linear journey. It is a very challenging journey, and it's important that we paint an accurate picture of that. But to, for our young players to have access to some top-class players like that is invaluable to them. In terms of support, all of our coaching staff, all of our technical staff, all must have the mental first aid qualification. As I mentioned earlier on, mental well-being, the welfare of children, is unbelievably important. We cannot disregard it anymore. It has to be given the attention that it truly deserves. So all of our staff must possess this mental health qualification so that, just like first aid, uh, medical first aid, so that they can provide, so the first, they can recognise any issues with mental health of our young people within the programme, but then they can start putting in steps to deal with it. Now, of course, we have an acceleration process where there's specialists that we can we can pass um, we can pass them on to, but it's so important that the mental health of our young players, our young people, is paramount to the overall program. One of the things we, we identified within the last three years is how our injured players are looked after. We, because of our dem, um, our location, we we have young people travelling an hour an hour and fifteen minutes to and from practice and training and games. When they're injured, we need to make sure that that travel is, um, is merited. So we have an injured player programme where any player who's injured can obviously still do their rehab and all the, the sports science elements and recovery of that. But they also get to coach some of our younger age groups and they get to design practices and they get to be involved so that they still very, very much feel part of the, the academy programme regardless if they're missing from, from training or games for a year, or if it's just a couple of weeks. It's so important that they, they, retain, they retain that connectedness. Unfortunately, they're not, every, not every single young person makes it as a professional footballer, so a player exit strategy um, is really robust to make sure that we provide aftercare for any player who exits our programme. We have a head of player care who is full time, who follows up with individual meetings with these young people, our coaching staff keep in touch with them. And even when these young people find a successful destination, more often than not, another professional football club, we continue to support them on that journey as well. And for anyone who hasn't seen um, the, the Crystal Palace um, article that was released last week, I think it was on Training Ground Guru, I would advise you to go and look at that. They have a three-year aftercare programme for any player who exits their academy, and it's absolutely fantastic. We are not at that level yet, but we're certainly heading in that direction. We, our head of player care has created an away goal programme, and we call it the away goal programme because it's the thing that nobody really thinks about. What happens if I don't become a professional footballer? So our away goal programme is aimed at the, the designing a second career for our young people. So in our professional environment, we are creating programmes 
where some of our young people can continue at school, even though they're full-time professional footballers, they can go to college, or they can take some specialist education, for example, uh, an internship where they can be, they start training as a joiner or an electrician or a mechanic. Whatever they, whatever they would be, whatever their away goal is, their plan B, we, we look to um, facilitate that within their weekly schedule so that they're continuing to develop a, a secondary career just in case that away goal is scored. We create strong education links with all secondary schools in particular, but we're now also branching into our primary schools where our kids from seven years old to 12 years old um, are as well. And it's so important for us that we have those links so that we can support the school with the same messages. And finally, our head of player care and other key staff meet one-to-one -one, um, with our, our young people um, every month every young player has a one-to-one -one meeting with the relevant staff and that is not to discuss soccer or football or performance it is solely just to discuss how they're feeling about things as well in terms of identity our mantra which comes from the head coach is player is king everything that we do must be a person-centered player first approach we cannot do anything just for the club or for the business, or for the academy, it must be what is the most beneficial thing we can do for this young person in front of us. And that is our mantra across. But it's not just about the identity of the club or the business, it's about who they are and making them a better version of themselves. So if you have a kid who loves a joke, who loves to carry on, who doesn't pay attention, we just need to work with that. Not every kid is the same. Every single kid is unique. And it's so important for us that we celebrate that. And yes, we do get annoyed. Yes, there are kids that push our patience. Yes, there are kids that do annoy us at times. But it's so important that we don't try and change who they are as a person. And we work with that young person to make sure that we're developing them for who they are first and foremost. We have reflective tasks where our young people reflect back on their own performance and their own experiences and the feedback in. But a big part of our programme is our leadership groups. And at every stage of the academy, we have leadership groups who work with our head of player, uh, player care to create new ideas, to innovate and to run some ideas. And some of the, the work that has been done in that has been excellent. Just before Christmas there, uh, our player leadership groups um, collected for food banks and donated to food banks. They collected toys and donated them to, to kids who are less fortunate than them. They collected clothes um, and, and done the same thing. And they really contributed uh, towards the, the local communities that they're from as well. And that was the leadership groups that came up with that, those ideas. And then our character development programme where we're, as, as mentioned earlier on, we're looking to develop their unique character, not the character that we perceive to be the high performance character that a young person should have. It's about developing their character. And we have several tasks and presentations, initiatives um, around that. Education, we, we look at developing life skills and career goals, and we put the, and that into their individual development plans as well. So that that is spoke about in these one-to-one -one meetings I mentioned earlier. We have a Parents United group as well, similar to a player leadership group. So our Parents United group are there to feedback information back into the academy staff to help evolve and design uh, redesign parts of the programme. And we also have parents education workshops. We find that a lot of football clubs, a lot of academies, try to keep their parents at arm's length, they try and distance themselves from the parents because we all know, I'm a parent myself, we all know that parents can be a nightmare at times when it comes to their son in elite sport. But we want to bring our parents closer so that we can educate them on our coaching methodology, on the things that you've heard me say tonight, so that they understand why we do certain things because that helps with consistency and clarity and messages when when the, the, the young person goes home to their family. If we can get their parents understanding and saying similar things to what we are seeing, 
even if it's just the culture, we're, we're giving that young person a more consistent experience and a better experience. We do things like a lifestyle workshops that I'm, I'm sure you do in terms of nutrition, hydration, sleep patterns, drug and alcohol, laws of the game, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a number of player-led initiatives that I spoke about earlier on. Andy, can I ask a question from the chat? Yeah, of course you can, not a problem. Is there a question, can you give us an example of a character development program? Yeah, so let me, let me give you uh, a, a, one of the best ones of recent. So we, we will give our young, our young people uh, a task. So for example, use the, the club legends as an example. So we had, um, we gave the, the young people in our school programs uh, a club legend who had won the league with the club, who had beat Barcelona, um, and they were asked to then go and do the research, um, dig a bit more detail into, into this character, uh, into this legend, club legend, uh, tell us a bit about his character, um, et cetera, et cetera, and how that also relates to them. So what did they see? Did they see some, some similar qualities in them as they did to the club legend? We then asked the, the, young, the young people to create a presentation um, for on that, that, that club legend. And we set a date for, for the, the, them to present back to what they believed was going to be the, the staff, the academy staff who they see every day and they have a really good relationship. Little did they know that we invited that club legend uh, into the presentations that day. And not only did they deliver the presentation, their research into the club legend in front of the academy staff, they also presented to the club legend himself as well. And that just built such a strong connection. And it was great because they got some stats wrong, the goals and appearances and, and so many things. But it created that connection to the history of the club um, for that young person um, and built that relationship between one of our most celebrated and successful players of all time. Um, but they went through that whole process of the, the research and comparing the, the analysis to them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they had to present what showed real character because it was a tough, a tough club legend. They had to show real, club, uh, real character to, to um, deliver the presentation in front of him. We, we have also mental performance tasks where they ask, we ask them to um, analyze one another, um, tell each other things about what, what annoys them within the group. So if they do, for example, things come out like oh, certain players carry on too much at training or certain players maybe don't work hard enough, this is all part of, of their character development as well. When we go on an additional games program, which I've just brought up there, uh, when we go to whether it's down south or it's across to Europe, we always add a cultural task to that as well. So it's not just about the, the tournament the football, it's also about them investing in the culture of that, that city or country, whatever it may be. And, and also doing some research behind that as well and how what messages they can take home. So we've been to some places where um, the kids have realised how fortunate they are in their lives, but then we want to really dig into what, what does that mean for your life then? So if you realise you're so lucky that you get all these experiences free of charge, but you've seen, you've seen a kid in the street begging or you've seen that other kids aren't as fortunate as you, what does that do for you? And it's all about initiating action, like we spoke about earlier on. So hopefully that gives that gives you three three different examples there. Okay, so additional games program is the the best part of our football program, as I mentioned there. For example, this year our kids, all age groups, will get at least one tournament in Europe where they will face teams such as Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Sporting Lisbon, Benfica, Atletico Madrid, Red Bull Leipzig, um, Juventus, Feyenoord, PSV Eindhoven. They get what a fantastic experience for these young, young people. 
And again, we tie that in with cultural visits uh, and the character development programme as well. We, the way we look at this is these young kids may never, ever, ever play the quality of these clubs at a senior level. So if we can give them as many of these experiences at a younger level, we're hopefully creating lifelong memories that last longer than any, any football career, as I said earlier on. And saying that, in a football-related sense, if we want to create Champions League players, we have to have our young people playing and competing and challenging against the future Champions League players more often. So this part of our programme is so important for both developing the person and developing the player. We have an Academy Awards night. It's not, not very often that, that this happens in elite um, football as such, but we want to celebrate the, the successes, the achievement, as I mentioned earlier on, of our young people. So every year we have an annual Academy Awards where we celebrate all the successes. We give out trophies and mementos. They get access to first team staff. They get access to Academy graduates and we make a real day of it. It's a day where the culture is really strong because all parents, stakeholders, sponsors are all in the same area um, celebrating the, the successes of our young people that year. We have two school programmes, and the reason we have two school programmes, one geographically, we have one in the Central Belt and we have one in the East, where we are based at Dundee United. The reason we wanted to make a hybrid programme or create hybrid programmes where education and football development go hand in hand is the shared experiences. Our young, our young people learn so much from one another that if they're living with one another every day, they're at the same school, same education, same classes, they're having the same individual um, tailored programme for them out in the football pitch, then they're sharing all that experience, which then promotes the accountability, which promotes the problem solving. And this is so important for us as well. So we create, the way we run our programme is to make sure that the players have the opportunity to, to solve one another's problems, support one another and help one another through the journey. We encourage through our Parents United group that all our teams have team days out. Again, it sounds some, so simple, but we have a, a, a lead parent in each group who organises trips away from football. We have kids geographically in different parts of Scotland, but we really don't want them just coming together for football or soccer. We want them coming together because we want to create friendships that last a, a lifetime as well. So a lot of our um, age groups now go go-kart run or they'll go to the inflatable uh, city place or whatever it may be. And they're really starting to kind of share one another's time out with football as well. And the biggest and most significant change we made in our programme when I came in is we cut our numbers right back. We only sign 12 players at any one age group. And the reason we do that is to give the, the, all the players within our programme as much individual attention as possible. So our coach to player ratio is one to three or one to four maximum because we have three age with three coaches at each age group. Previously, we had, I think we had about 120 players within the academy programme and we cut that back to 77 players within the academy programme. The benefit of that is, well, Kids want to play football. There's now more playing minutes for them to play football. Kids get more attention and support from the adult. Um, kids get better opportunities to play up age groups and go to tournaments as well. Um, and that's th just an overall better experience for that young person. There's no jersey fillers, as we call them. There's nobody sitting on the substitutes bench that isn't going to get game time. They all get that experience and they all get the same experience as well. It still has to be earned, it's still hard work, but by having lower numbers, it gives them that better experience, a stronger experience. And the last thing on this is every year, we send out a survey to all our parents to asking for their critical feedback on every single thing that we do within the programme, every single thing that we do. And the players and parents must complete that together, and it must be as honest as possible. And I'll speak a wee bit more about that later, but that is down to the quality of the sessions, 
how much they're enjoying it, um, the communication levels, the coach-player relationships, and they grade every single aspect um, and give us, provide us feedback on how we can improve each of those aspects as well. Again, if we are promoting the, the, the quality of accountability, we have to take accountability and understand what we need to do better for our young people. So on, on the individual development plans, just to give you a wee bit more information, we go through a, a four stage process of review, design, implementation and review again, and we continuously on that cycle. So as you can see, without laboring the point, we always um, promote the self review um, of our young players. You can see it, player input, self review, one to one meetings, goal setting, everything we try and pass as much of this onto the young person as possible, not because we're lazy, not because we want to count, cut corners, but we really need them to own their journey, own their development plan. And if we can't do that, if we are saying, here you go, here you go, and we just give, give, give all the time, we need to educate our young people and develop our young people to be able to crit critically analyse themselves, take accountability, and as we said earlier, initiate action. So yes, the adults, the coaching staff, the technical staff are all supporting our young people throughout this uh, process. We do look at um, specialist support um, as well, if it was in psychology or physical performance or whatever it may be, but we try and pass as much of this implementation and design onto the young people so that they own it. It's their journey. It's up to them to go and own it. Couple of things just to highlight is because we have low numbers, the individual development plans will influence our practice design. So it's no longer do we put on generic football sessions. We, we design our sessions based around the individual development plans. We base our match performance around the match objectives. Every individual player has specific unique match objectives to get into a game. Of course, every single player wants to win the game that they're playing in, but there needs to be a bigger reason for them to play football. And so that is when we go back to the achievement. If they can prog make progress on one thing in their individual development plan within a game, then the game has been worth so much more than three points or the victory. So what does this look like? Again, as you can see here, this is a, a player review which is completed by both the player and the member of staff, the relevant member of staff. And you can see also, it's not just about the technical and tactical attributes. It is not about weaknesses. This is about their strengths. It is, yes, it's about their technical, but it's also about their lifestyle, their education, their character development as well. Um, and you can see here, we've got lifestyle development where the player grades himself and the, the coach grades. We have social development within this. Um, we have a rating index as well, where we can they can compare where, to see where they are, if they're exceeding expectations, et cetera. Um, and then an overall rating. This then feeds into um, a more aesthetically pleasing graph where they can compare themselves. And what we really like is when we get a difference between the two, because then that initiates conversation. And that's when we can really help the young person because if this young person, this is just a made up one, this isn't a, um, a fact one, a factual one. If this young person is saying his overall development rating is higher than what we believe it to be, then that's fantastic because we can have a, a development conversation. And it might be that the coaches maybe got things wrong, but we can have that development conversation and really drill into the detail of each individual aspect now as well. Once the players have completed that at the younger age groups. This is what their individual development plan would look like. So this is for our younger kids um, up to the age of under 13, 14. This is all about their identity. So as you can see here, my identity, and this is all the things that they see themselves as a young player. So this player sees um, himself as somebody they can build out from the back, that somebody that can be aggressive, and someday they can organise his defensive units. So our job is to improve this and make him better for who he is as well. We provide them with a role model who they then watch. This player has picked Sergio Ramos. 
And the most important part of this is for them to be ambitious and dream big. So this player wants to make his uh, debut for Manchester United by the age of 25. We will never put a ceiling on what our young people can achieve, as we mentioned earlier on with ambition. So it's so important for us to make sure that we do everything that we can to, to help this young player achieve that. And as they progress through the academy and they get to the older ages, their individual development plan becomes more detailed, it becomes bigger, uh, and it becomes more specific where there's more data, more analysis um, on things such as their technical attributes, physical, match day, uh, all their individual sessions, their goal setting, and everything is tracked and analysed and compared to the relevant competition within the first team, but also within our talent ID and recruitment strategy as well. So this is a young player, it's just turned 19, who is in the first team just now. Um, and if we click on each of those links, which I won't do, you can see all the tabs down the bottom, you'll get a breakdown of everything that he's done to improve him and his identity within, within the programme. I'll just get a few questions coming up. Um, who do we have? Uh, Gavin. You okay with just answering these just now, Rick? Sure, yeah, that was about the numbers, so go ahead, yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's just asked, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Gavin. I've just answered the question. Uh, so yeah, at the early stages, Gavin, just to give you probably a wee bit more detail, these are uh, early ages we, we have, well, mostly this is more about creating habits for our young players to get into, more about the self-analysis part, the conversations, the, the coach-player relationships, um, developing accountability in our young players. But as they progress through the academy journey to, to the professional end, there'll be specific data and metrics that are attached to these that we can give them a more accurate score rather than just opinion-based. And again, this is where that comes into here. So a success so far. So this very much, this is a long-term project. Uh, we were fortunate that we inherited um, a, an academy that had some top talent, some top potential at the older age groups that we could get to work with straight away. But a few of our successes so far, so we are the first club to be promoted to the elite tier, the top tier of academy football in Scotland since 2017. That involved us going through a process of um, the Scottish FA looking at our coaching methodology, our player pathway, our strategy documents, et cetera, et cetera, and then uh, grading us and we were promoted to the top tier of academy football um, within six months um, of starting the role. We have 60, we've had 16 graduates who have deb made their debut, their first team professional debut in the last three years. We've also had several records broken. We've had the youngest ever deputant for the club. We've had the youngest ever starter for the club. And we've had the youngest ever player to play in a Dundee derby within the club. If we had a boy on, on, a, on the substitutes bench at the weekend who was 16 years and two days, if he had made his debut, he would have been the youngest ever player in the history of Scottish football, Scottish professional football. But unfortunately, he didn't make his debut. So we'll need to hopefully break that record another time as well. We've had the, in our history right now, we have the highest amount of young players playing in Scotland under 16s. Um, between Scotland under 16s and the A squad, uh, which is also the first team squad um, across all age groups. And for our American owners, um, it's very important that we our return on investment model is a, a profitable one. And after, after selling Kerr Smith at 17 years old to Aston Villa and then goes Premier League, and Scott Banks to Crystal Palace and then goes Premier League. Jamie Robson to an English club and Louis Appert to an English club. Um, we are now in profit. So we have um, brought in more income to the club than what we've spent in the last three years now as well. Not to mention the, the half of our first team squad uh, is, is now from the academy, which saves on signing on fees, agents fees, and obviously salaries as well, because these players are younger um, and they're, they're on less wages at that moment. So that we have made a, a significant return on the investment made. We have had five 
um, academy staff promoted to the first team, including their head coach, our assistant coach, the head of analysis, the head of tactical performance, um, and a sports scientist. I've all came from the academy and now promote now, are now working um, within the first team environment. Uh, and we've now our head of player development now works within the the, the first team now as well. And he is now he, he's the one that's created the individual development plans, and now he's running that with the first team players as well. Andy, there are a couple of questions. Do you mind if I jump in with a couple of those? No, go for it. No problem. Can you, would you, could you go back to the slide that had the numeric ratings? Yeah, no problem. There we go. Uh, I think the question is, what what are the point systems uh, based upon? Like, what does a three mean? What is a four? What is a five? Yeah, yeah. So at, at the early ages, um, as I've mentioned, I think it was Gavin that asked the question. Um, five is exceptional, excellent, and very good. Is four good? Is three? Um, two as um barely achieving standards and one is significantly below standards as you can see here just at the, the rating index down the side here uh, at the youngest age groups the number isn't very important it's more about the process the habit and the conversations that it leads to that it instigates as they as they progress through the academy we then have specific metrics and data that attach to each one of these so if it's a five for example significantly exceeds standards that's because our data is actually shown, the analysis that we've put in is shown that um, this player is exceeding. And that could be something simple as, as you say, Archie here wants to improve um, his penetrating passing rate by 30% within a 12-week period, and he improves it by 40% in that 12-week period. That would be graded as a five, as an example, because he's exceeded the expectations as well, well and above what, uh, what was set for him. I hope that answers that question. So it's based on an individualized standard, not some objective standard. Like you're not comparing no. the player to the other players in their age group, for example. No, no, because they're all different. They're all different. So we we did have a period um, where we had we designed player profiles um, within the first year where we wanted certain characteristics, technical and tactical more so, um, of a right back, of a central midfielder, of a striker. But what we quickly found out, and I mentioned this earlier, is we were actually limiting how innovative and creative that player could be. And we were almost pigeonholing players far too early. Whereas when we've done our research and analysis on the modern game, and I'll use Manchester City as an example, that we use Jao Cancelo, who plays right back, he plays left back, he plays central midfield. Kevin De Bruyne predominantly plays central midfield, but he can play as a false nine, he can play in the wide areas uh, and he can also pick the ball up at central, uh, in a central defensive position as well. So if these player profiles were far too uh, restrictive and allowing our players that freedom to go and express themselves and create the future players, as I mentioned earlier on. So it's very much an individual um, assessment. Yeah, your comments are relevant to another question that was just asked in the Q&A, do you have player profiles based on position in the younger age groups? And do you connect the player profile with the IDP? Um, no, uh, at the younger age group, so under 11s to under 13s, every single player should, should get experience of playing every single position on the pitch. Bar goalkeeper, although I will say our under 11s goalkeeper just now, that was brought into the academy as an outfield player and um, so we've maybe landed lucky with that one and it's something we're looking at in more detail now and um, as they progress they start to get some more position position specific work uh, under 14s under 15s under 16s under 18s however there's a bit of there's a lot of flexibility in that whereas archie for example here has played holding midfield attacking midfield false nine and of both both wings so his position specific program is flexible enough to make sure that he's got transferable skills in all of those positions as well we don't want to ever restrict what a player can be so we won't tie them down to a single position and say no you can't move this is the position for you and that's it is that all the questions so far well 
I have one if I can jump in with one. Uh, of course. You've mentioned how how important it is. One of your principles is to f build connection for players to feel a sense of unity with their club, with their team, with their coach, and how important it is for your coaches to be able to facilitate that and develop connection with their players. And I'm wondering, there's a lot of coaching education resources out about how to teach soccer to different age groups, different players of different abilities, etc. But do you do you view in your club the the ability to teach those life skills, to teach connection to children? Is that a skill? And if so, what do you do to develop your coaches in those skill sets? Yeah, that's just like that's just something that we we need to get better at. It's something we're working with our coaches on. And I would take it a step further back. I think before you you allow a coach to have a say on um how a young person should think or develop or whatever it may be, the first and most important thing is you, your coach has to understand the young person first. So until, until that happens, um, understanding the family background, understanding the, even the, the specific stage of development, um, what their school day was like, what challenges they're facing in their life, why they see the world and the way they see the world. Until that part happens, it doesn't matter what the next part is, how educated they are. So that's the most important thing. So building a relationship with the person, first and foremost, will ultimately allow you um, a route in to, to finding more of that stuff out. As part of our coach education program now, um, through our head of coaching, we're now uh, working closely with our mental performance team to, to educate our staff uh, and one, understanding the person, but also simple things like their communication skills. How do you speak to an 11 year old who's feeling a certain way? How do you change that when you're speaking to a 16 year old in a certain way? Um, and not so much with the kids, but we also were, were coaching and educating our staff and not just managing and developing kids and themselves, but also managing up for their own career development as well. So this is all part of our kind of new coach education program. Uh, as I said, it's very early stages. Some some of our staff are absolutely fantastic, and we learn a lot from them. Others still need uh, a lot of work, and they need to understand the 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 power that one sentence or even one word at times can have. And that's the biggest thing. How do you speak to people? How do you build that connection? How do you get that understanding with them? How do you show them that you care? Um, and then the kind of more research and knowledge behind that is something that we're filtering in bit by bit. Is that us for just now? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so just to, fi just to finish off before we open for more questions, um, we're the only club in Scotland to now have two full-time school programmes, which, as I said, is a hybrid education and football development programme where football is integrated as part of their school timetable um, as another subject. And we offer additional support, holistic support with their education um, and the player care as well. We, we're currently going through a facility redevelopment project just now. We, we do believe we have a really strong programme, but we now need the facility to match to make sure that we can really enhance the player experience uh, parent and player feedback ratings on the most part have increased year on year over the last three years and this year we recorded our best feedback stats from our parents again and we only we give them the 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 offer of a, an excellent rating very good good average or poor rating and we only judge ourselves against the excellent ratings because we want to be ambitious and get to as close to 100 percent excellent as possible in each of the aspects our player retention data is also increasing after the first year when we had to cut the numbers back because not enough kids were playing enough football um, in basic terms. Uh, we have not released a single player in the last two years for a performance-related issue. We have only released a player at their request because they were finding the travel too much, um, school was maybe not going as well, um, they maybe wanted to try a different sport or whatever it may be. That is the only um, the only reasons that we've released a player. Not one single player has been released 
um, for performance related issues in two years. But the biggest success will always be this. Do you have kids that have a big smile on their face like that when they come and play? Like that, and that, and that. Ultimately, if they don't have that, you're not going to get any success. They start to play football because they love the sport, because they love being around their teammates, because they love all the experiences that, that soccer, that football can provide them. If you forget that, and you start thinking about the player too much, or the wins, or the three points, or the goal scored, or whatever it may be, you'll lose that. You must always retain that. It's so important. Guys, obviously, I'll open the, the floor to, to questions now. However, I, I've um, listed my email address there if anyone want, would like to follow up and drop an email. Um, you can see a, a lot of what we do on uh, my own and the Academy uh, Twitter accounts as well, which are listed there. So to feel free to follow them. I'll look into more information and, and connect afterwards, but more than happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have uh, this morning as well. There's a question here. Do you have profiles for the first team? <sighs> yes and no. Um, this We start to formalise um a profile relating to the strategy strategy of what that game is going to be so the tactical plan for that game um that could change so it might be for example that the the head coach wants a more defensive minded fullback um to play because we we'll just say we're playing Glasgow Celtic their wingers are really attacking really aggressive on the attack and we need somebody who's more switched on defensively but in that squad, we'll also have a really um, aggressive attacking fullback as well, and that that player will come into the um, will come into the team if we are playing a a, a more um, what would you say expansive style of football at that point. So it's more probably game by game. Um, we don't look. We probably look for what we need within the squad rather than um, creating a specific profile. For, for each position, if that makes sense. Thank you. Somebody's asking if you can show the the our success so far slide again. Oh, yeah, no problem at all. And while you're doing that, there's a question. How does, oops, just lost it. How does a required, is it ROI? Impact, yeah. impact the development process of potential first team players is the main focus to sell players on to break even or to develop elite first teamers or is there a balance yeah all oh, there's a there's a fine there's a fine balance so return on investment model is that we want to be a sustainably profitable club and um, we have american owners um, who bought the club the month before I was appointed as academy director. And they were very clear from the start that they wanted to, to make a return on their investment into the club. Um, very rarely, particularly in Scottish football, do clubs return a profit. However, if we go back to what we're saying about being ambitious earlier on, if we really are innovative and we really are creative, we can spend our limited resources really well, then we'll get the we'll get the, the the success. So we don't, in comparison to Glasgow Rangers, Glasgow Celtic, Aberdeen, Hearts, we we have a smaller budget than them. But at this moment in time, we are we are really successful in terms of the number of graduates that are playing, the number of debuts, the the percentage of academy players within our first team squad, um, is all really high. And now we're starting to see the success of that by selling players. We'll have, we have five um, different levels of player. We have the first one as the one that we really want, is the one that goes into the first team squad, gets success in terms of trophies or higher league positions or international appearances with the first team. And we sell that player at peak value, 23, 24 years old, as an example. We have our early sellers. So Kerr Smith at 17 year old, Scott Banks at 19 years old, 
we sold early because we believed in terms of the player pathway that they wouldn't maximize their we wouldn't be able to maximize their game opportunity because they had um high competition of first team players more experienced players ahead of them so we sold them at their peak value for that age we have a third grade of player who will continue to play in our first team for a prolonged period of time um, and be a, a member of the first team squad who may not start every week but he'll be a valuable member of the squad a fourth player a fourth grade player who will possibly get a professional contract or move on to a different club and achieve success within soccer elsewhere and the last one is the one that we really want to work on and improve is the ones who don't have any career in football or soccer um, how do we work and make sure they're successful on their away goal what is their plan b how do we make sure that these skills and experiences that they've had within their academy allows them to transition to a different career okay thanks sandy um so last call for questions those of you who are still with us uh, and in the in the meantime so th Andy, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge, your expertise, um, and a lot of the best practices of your programming with Dundee United. Um, there was, in a way, too much here. And if you're like me and you felt like it was uh, a flood of information, uh, we NorCal is going to record this presentation. And so uh, it will be posted on our website, on our club development resources. So you can come back and fill in the blanks that you may have missed on this first go around. Um, and last but not least, I may mention that uh, next month we will have another presenter, Sky Eddie Bruce from SoccerParenting.com is going to be presenting a webinar and that's going to be on March 7th, a month from now. So we hope you can tune in then as well. So again, Andy, thanks so much for your time and expertise and um, it was fantastic. Thanks for doing this for us. Oh, not a problem, Rick. Thank you. And, and thanks to all the participants and for the for the great questions that they asked as well. Always nice to have questions and it shows that they were listening and, and um, interested in what I had to say. But feel free to follow up, guys. The details are there once again. Um, happy to answer any further questions, should you have any. Fantastic. Then you, I think you're in charge of shutting it down, Andy. Thank you. Not a problem. Thank you. Thanks. All right.